Well, hello, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 425th New Social Environment. I'm Nick Bennett, the Special Projects Editor here at The Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation between Julian Charrier and Julie Reese. We're thrilled to have the poet Matt Reek here, who will read to close today's program. A few quick notes before we get started. Here at The Rail, we're celebrating our 21st anniversary by working on our first ever endowment campaign. This initiative will ensure the print edition of The Rail and our public programming, celebrating cross-pollination in the arts, humanities, and sciences, all remains free and accessible for generations to come. Please check the chat for more information and links that will be posted shortly. The Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenny Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions that we'll also be posting in just a moment. Now to introduce today's guest and host, artist Julian Charrier is known for a research-based practice rooted in geology, biology, physics, history, and archeology. span A participant of the Institute for Spatial Experiments, Charrier has exhibited his work both individually and as part of the Berlin-based art collective Das Neumann, at museums and institutions worldwide. As a nominee of the 2021 Prix Marcel Duchamp, his work is currently on view at the Centre Pompidou through January 2022. And our host today, art historian Julie Reese, focuses on artistic responses to the climate crisis. She's the editor of the 2019 anthology Art, Theory, and Practice in the Anthropocene. In 2019, she organized the symposium, The Role of Art uh, in the Environmental Crisis, held at Christie's Education, and was the guest critic on the same theme here at the Brooklyn Rail. She is the author of From Margin to Center, The Spaces of Installation Art, and was previously director of Modern and Contemporary Art and the Market at Christie's Education. Without further ado, handing it over to you, Joel. We just have to, there we are. Thank you, Nick. I think I'd know that by now. Uh, and thank you everyone to the rail for organizing this um, so that we could have, I think this, this very timely uh, discussion. Uh, I'm delighted to be in conversation with Julian Charrier uh, during this two week climate summit in Glasgow. World leaders are discussing how to mitigate and forestall the climate crisis. And I think that Julian's work, which deals with past, present, and future, and uh, geology and the human role in our new kind of terraforming, uh, that his work is, is framed by, uh, although not specifically defined by, is framed by this context. And I feel like this is a really great moment to, uh, to talk about it. Uh, so I, I want to just kind of jump in there. Um, we're going to be looking at a number of works. We'll finish by looking at the work currently on view at the Pompidou Center. Um, and there's there's a lot to say. So um, let's bring up the first slide. And uh, Julian, let's uh, let's talk. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Um, Very nice to be here. Thank you. I wanted to uh, start here. Um, this is. Uh, well, Julian can tell you what's going on in this work, and then we'll maybe tell you why we started. Julian, what are you doing here in this work? Uh, well, in 2013, um, I, I decided to climb an iceberg and to try to melt it down with a blowtorch. So burning uh, fossil gases, which are in, in my backpack, in order to melt down a blue fossil, a chunk of ice, which had been formed 30,000 years ago. Uh, on a glacier in Iceland, and uh, eventually it's it's kind of like an early piece uh, that I, I was still studying while doing it. I think it's the last year of my studies, uh, where I tried to invert uh, this idea of separation that we inherit from the Romantic, where man is always on the side, kind of an observer. And here I want to bring this silhouette, this avatar uh, for us, for our species, into the picture in the center, but also into this kind of direct interaction um, with the landscape. And, and actually, uh, on one hand, we can see a, a metaphor of, you know, um, induced, uh, man-induced global warming. On the other hand, 
it's also about the kind of futility of humanity uh, in these temporalities, uh, temporalities that we can't uh, grasp. I mean, when we think about 30,000 years, it's extremely abstract. And, and I wanted to, to try to sense that and to engage um, with these temporalities um, and with my body. And um, it's a series of photographs at the end, three photographs which document uh, this action where for seven and a half hour, I was trying to melt down the ice under my feet without much success because it was minus 15 degree and uh, it would actually just, you know, melt a little bit, but it will refreeze a few centimeters further. And, um, but it's, it's kind of like an, in, an important work which, on which I build uh, a lot of what I'm actually doing today. And, and I think it's, even though it was 2013, it's, it's still very important today. And I think that we will understand that once we uh, getting to the end of our presentation, when I will be speaking a bit more about what I've been doing for uh, the Weight of Shadow, the presentation uh, at the Centre Pompidou which actually yeah. deal with this idea of memory and this idea of great reversal. I, I think this is a really interesting work. I was thinking when I looked at it, the idea of trying to melt a iceberg with a blowtorch and Alan Caprow's idea of useless work, this absolutely futile gesture. But I also, it reminds me of the, um, the sort of the 19th century tradition of explorers and tourists going to look at the ice in the Swiss Alps. I know that this wasn't done in the Alps, but you know, you you come from Switzerland, a, a land that in most of our imaginaries is associated uh, with with ice. And I just I wondered if you if there's any connection there. Does this relate at all to the the landscape that you were surrounded with, or is it really about leaving that and starting a long career of making expeditions to faraway places? Um, well, I mean, I think that uh, growing up in the country where I did had a big influence in the way I'm seeing the world, but also a big influence about like reacting to this kind of like construction that we apply on certain type of landscape. I mean, uh, I, I, I didn't experience that because I'm too young for it, but Switzerland and the kind of like construction of landscape in, in the Western world vision uh, been very important, but we had to have the British and the French people coming through, or even the German, in order to understand what the Alps meant. And, and, and today we, we still live on this kind of like, it's almost a PR, like the a pristinity of our mountain. At the same time, what's very important uh, is also that if you think about the cryospheres, the glacier, you always think about eternity, pristine landscape, but they're one of the most polluted places in the world. You have all these pollutants which are attracted by the cold of the ice itself and, and, and get stuck into these ice masses. And that's uh, something which was important for me. As for the history, I think that um, Switzerland is kind of like a, a very tamed landscape. It's constructed, is overly um, connected, you have street, you can never walk somewhere without meeting someone. I mean, it's, it's very much inhabited, uh, it's, it's very much constructed. And the first time I went to the Arctic in 2011 uh, to Iceland after the actual eruption of the Eyjat Fatlajökull, this volcano that we might remember because in Europe we could not fly anymore for a few weeks yes. due to the ashes. Yes. Uh, I kind of like get uh, very touched and somehow bulversed by my experience there. So experiencing the Arctic is a very new way of like understanding uh, space in terms of, of scale, depths, and distances. Uh, I think that there's something that's not only the light, you know, like the darkness in the winter, which can go up for six months and the, and the ever daily light in the day, but it's also about having uh, nothing between his my feet, my eyes, and the horizon line giving me kind of like a sense of depth and scale. And being lost into this landscape um, brought me to a lot of reflection that I then developed into works. And I, I kind of started dialogue with these places, with up north and, and down south. And the first time that I get back in 2013, I really wanted to kind of like uh, interact directly with, within this kind of framework. 
I, th I think that that makes a lot of sense in terms of where we're going to be going from here. Um, actually, Nick, can we have the next slide? Uh, because it seems like you begin to really uh, interrogate this idea between the uh, imaginary landscape and the representation of a landscape and the rea uh, the reality of one. It's you know what you said. Most of us don't think of the Alps as being a very polluted place. So uh, you sort of go on from there to try to uh, expose um, something that's actually going on in terms of the toxicity of of different places. And the next few works in in different ways you know deal with this issue of radioactivity in particular. Um, and I would like to you know, take some time to to look at that and to think about um, you know your travels to parts of the world that are contaminated by radioactive waste and you know what what drew you to them as a kind of continuous exploration of this idea of the imaginary and the real and the representation of a place. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think that. Um take this decision to actually uh, travel to two atomic test sites, one being uh, in Kazakhstan, uh, in the middle of the steppes, being the former uh, Sovietic test site of Semipalatinsk, also known uh, under the name Polygon, that's the picture that you see here. And as a counterpart, uh, I did like a, I traveled to the Bikini Atoll, the Bikini uh, Atom test site of the US Navy in the Marshall Island. Um, to actually make two survey of places which somehow are extremely important for the way that we engage with the world today. Because we all know in the 60s that we first went out in space and, and saw our planet as a kind of like a sphere, a, a finite uh, environment. Uh, there was no infinity anymore and we had to deal with that. We were all in this little spaceship called Earth. And then on the other hand, we're also kind of like being confronted to uh, nuclear blast and explosion, uh, first with the bombing of, of Nagasaki, but then also with the deployment of, uh, of a nuclear weapon into the landscape in form of, for me, was kind of like reacting on a, a form of image as weapon. You know, we, the, the US Navy developed kind of like a program of image making in order to um, create an iconography of the atomic age, which was an iconography of, of power and destruction. And it was the first moment that we could grasp that we had everything in our hand to kind of end the story of our species. And I think that was something which was very important. And as an anecdote, when you, as a Swiss person, you always leave <laughs> with a house which have an atomic bunker in the basement, uh, which is kind of like a funny note, but, that's where we used to play, you know, as a kid or, or collect uh, little animals that I was uh, gathering into the forest and, and so on. But um, so I, I decided to go there for a different reason, but the main reason was really the idea of exclusion, like uh, an exclusion zone, which somehow um, for me was a window in a speculative future. So it's a contaminated space, but it's so contaminated that humankind cannot go there anymore. I mean, you can for a very short amount of time, but no one does. And therefore we have a, a new ecosystem, a reborn ecosystem, a, a, a certain nature, a kind of contaminated ecosystem. And I was very interested in uh, going there and, and seeing what it means, because you have like this gap between, I mean, more than on Polygon, maybe we can go to the next. Yeah, let's uh, go on. to the first light. Yeah, on bikini, uh, we all know bikini somehow. Bikini is part of a visual culture, but it's also part of the vocabulary through the swimming suit, right? Uh, which is directly de de uh, derivated from the bomb on the beach uh, from 54. And it's a place which has been heavily documented, heavily, 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 but it's a place which uh, any kind of like emotional link to a population is not existing anymore. So the, I don't know if I will explain the full story, but the US Navy in the 50s asked, uh, I mean, free the Bikinian from the Japanese, um, you know, possession and, and, um, and yeah, they were actually 
uh, under uh, Japanese uh, threat and they get free from the Japanese Navy. And then uh, they ask the Marshallese if they would like to give the island for the good of mankind at the end of old war. And it's a pretty tragic story. And the Marshallese uh, gather together the Bikinian and decide, okay, if it's for the end of old war and the good of mankind, we will give you our island uh, in order to test your devices. And from there on, you have like this uh, 20 years of heavy atmospheric testing going on, like uh, some of the most powerful bomb being de detonated on the beach. And I saw there was like this kind of uh, crazy contrast between this paradise, this kind of uh, archetypal uh, idea of a paradise, the atoll, the palm tree, the beach, something that we, that we still kind of uh, see as the last, you know, the last resort, the last place of uh, symbiosis of environment, the atoll is always kind of like a symbol. And at the same time, the absurdity and the atrocity of the destruction uh, uh, brought by, by the testing. And today, 70 years later, no one has been there, or very little people, very little human interaction. So you have a, a natural world which kind of uh, get back into its own right and develop without being somehow, um, you know, triggered by, by, or like, or changed by our actions. And, and that is because it's contaminated. And I wanted to work on, on this idea, like once, like, you know, the, the typical, like, postcard picture, sunset on the beach, but then how to grasp what makes this reality so special and, 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 and so strange and uncanny. And I, um, looking into the history of radioactivity, I mean, radioactivity is something which is normally born with the auditive uh, sense. So if you know radioactivity, not many knows, but you normally know it through a noise, which is the noise of the Geiger counter. And that's the way you sense it. And that's the way we sensed it being on site. But then Becquerel uh, discovered radioactivity, not through sound, but through an image uh, in 1894, putting some Iran salt on a photosensitive plate by chance, say the legend, and like taking his draw the day after, figure out that the Iran salt lets an imprint onto this photogram. And he, make obviously the uh yeah like the connection okay if there is an imprint it's mean that the uran salt is emanating a ray that the eye cannot grasp but that the photosensitive plate could see and so the idea of this work was actually to render this presence onto a picture and i did um, a series of um, large-scale analog photograph but they're double exposed. So it's kind of like a double synthetic topography which has been displayed. So you have the, the place uh, as the way we see it. And then I took the negative and I take, took the radioactive sand and crushed coral uh, of the surrounding beaches and let it on the, on, on the negative for up to a month. And the radioactivity kind of, uh, you know, exposed the picture as it exposed our bodies, only we don't sense it, but the film could sense it. And now you have the same kind of like what you hear when you're listening to the crackling Geiger counter, you have it here with this kind of sparks and ghost-like uh, flex on the, on the picture. And it's like a, a full series of the, this kind of like strange landscape. I think it's, it's really kind of incredible. In, in some other contexts, you've talked about how one of the roles of the artist is to make the invisible visible, to turn something into a representation. And one of the issues about contaminated landscapes is, as you've pointed out, you could look at them and they don't look contaminated. You know, it doesn't necessarily show. Sometimes it shows and, and you will look at that as well. Um, but in this case, uh, you've you've made that toxicity show. And uh, I think it's- uh, well, I think that's one of the biggest yeah. dilemma of our society is that actually uh, pollutants and contamination is mostly invisible. 
and it's mostly surrounding us. And I mean, like, uh, we'll talk about it later, but we are burning fuel and bringing the ground into the sky and the sky might fall onto our heads uh, very soon. And we, we cannot sense it. We cannot sense the pollutants which are in the air. We can, we never sense it, but we never really um, safe or, or far away from this pollution or, or from this contamination. And that's something which is very interesting because you have this idea of remote, but actually the far away is very near in the world we're living in. And I think that's something which is extremely important within my works is even if I'm going to very remote places to talk about problems which concern us all, those problems are actually circulating around the globe and are a part of our daily life, you know, in, in one form or another. And um, yeah, and I think that today, like artists also have the task of bringing this invisibility or those sight or like kind of like an understanding of those places and, and, and framing it and bringing it back because um, even though one could say that's uh, aesthetizing a problem, I think that you, you need to kind of show it because that's this way of visual orientation is fundamental, um, you know, like to make these places exist in a kind of like a social fabric. So well, I think, I think that those are those are important issues. Now, if we can look at some of the ones from uh, towards no earthly pole, I think that this is um, this really gets a little bit at what you're talking about. Uh, this the problem of aestheticizing, which sometimes has been referred to as the toxic sublime, you know, when wasteland photography becomes in some strange way beautiful, and then it seems like there's almost an, an awe for the degree of destruction that some people have been able to uh, to impose upon the landscape at the same time as you want to say, oh, this is a terrible thing. So that, that kind of uh, beauty, horrible, uh, you know, powerful, overly powerful. Uh, but one of the things that, that I think this series, uh, Towards No Earthly Pole, uh, it makes it so successful is I actually think you avoid the toxic sublime because there's, you know, you'll, you'll tell us a little bit about where these are and, and why they're so dark, but they're scary. Uh, to me, they're scary. And so I feel like there's no way we could say, oh, look at that lovely wasteland. It's so pretty, you know. So I think that that you have a very good sense of of where to stop when it comes to aestheticizing um, disaster. So I wonder if you can talk a little bit about these because they are absolutely unearthly. Yes, so this this is uh, a work which is actually um, a video work from 104 minutes. And we have a few stills photographed because I'm normally always working in both media. I, I'm coming more from photography, but I actually uh, working in, in video now for the last five years and, and did some quite large scale project. And, and the biggest is this uh, three years um, video work that I developed in both polar region. Uh, not mostly because it's like a wasted landscape, even though they are very problematic today, but also uh, for the fact that again, we are confronted here to an absolute construction. Uh, we, we always kind of like um, sense these places and they're particularly uh, symptomatic of the way we engage with the world today, which is a way which is uh, driven through, um, you know, like digital media access, uh, direct access to information. So we, if I tell you North Pole or South Pole, you will have a very uh, clear image of, of something which is obviously a cliche, which is maybe um, triggered by the subjectivity of, you know, like the great age of exploration in the north or the great age of uh, science exploration in the south. And, and, and we, we will have like a, a proper kind of uh, landscape being built on a few pictures. Normally it's not so many pictures. And I like to think about these pictures like being little atoms and these atoms, we tend to bring them together in form of like complex molecule, which then form complexer atmosphere and those atmosphere, the atmosphere of like a visual culture and the visual culture of the polar region. It's very present. It's very present because it became the flagship of the Anthropocene and it's been like almost every day on the newspaper and through proliferation, we also have kind of like a banalization. The more you see this kind of blue iceberg, the less you uh, tend to 
to be attracted to them or the less you relate to them. And there is uh, something which is interesting is that there is like an absolute um, absence of depiction at night. And we have six months of night in both uh, polar region. And this night have been somehow like a blackout. A blackout uh, for me was very interesting because it's about disorientation. And disorientation is exactly the contrary of what the kind of romantic idea of a landscape uh, try to uh, uh, give us because you have like this overview. And, and the film is kind of developing itself into this gap between the representation or the represented or like the projection that we put onto these places, but then also the tangible reality of these places, which change so fast today that the collective consciousness or like the kind of like visual culture or collective visual culture cannot adapt. You know, when like the change in one place is, is, is the, the velocity of this change is so high that uh, the way we, we actually construct that uh, is not fitting anymore. And uh, so the, the movie is actually a collection of different takes, video takes into different landscape, which are done exactly like we are doing it in our brain, put together the real images, but they're layered in, into something that I like to call a um, digital diorama. And the camera is then flying from one landscape to the other and, and, and create kind of like a fictional topography where the viewer, which encountered this topography is first lost because you lost, that was what I was explaining before, kind of like complete loss of sense of scale, size, mostly in the video, you, it's more like close up. So you don't, you can't relate to the uh, horizon, uh, horizon line. And then you actually end up like flying over a sea which become a waterfall and this waterfall become an iceberg and everything seems so real and so obvious, but you are in a, in a place which is impossible. It's almost like an Escher kind of like, um, a landscape construction and um, so that was kind of like the core of, of the idea to actually create also a new aesthetic for a place we think we know but we eventually don't and 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 i i'm, I'm not saying that i i do know it but i spent a few months in the winter there trying to actually grasp the kind of like spirit of of the place and enter in like a fruitful dialogue with uh with a particular landscape that I really like. And I really like the ice as kind of like an agent because ice is rock or mineral, but it's a mineral which act in the eons, like in a thousand, a hundred thousand of years, but also lacked in the immediacy of how a perception. So you can relate to it. The glacier is actually moving. The glacier is cracking, groaning. The glacier is actively re uh, like actively engaging with you. Uh, and 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 at the same time, the glacier is also like um, the witness of you know, like the last 300,000 years, depending where you stand. And I think that's something which, uh, which like this kind of immensity and being lost in this immensity uh, is, is one of the motto of my work. And that's something that I, tr I try to kind of precipitate into this, uh, this movie and, uh, and, and, and give back to an audience than in the gallery, obviously. So the actual movie does have the sound of the glacier? Have some sounds of the glacier, have some like a uh, piezo microphone recording of the cracking ice, of the little airs bubble being released, like this kind of like pocket of ancient story, ancient atmosphere being released, and also uh, iceberg kind of uh, scratching the ocean floors and so on. And then it's also composed. Uh, I, I, I work with Robert Lippock, which is a German composer. Uh, and before I brought him all the sound recording that I did, I asked him to kind of create kind of like a toolbox or a, um, a collection of sound because he's never been to the Arctic. And I wanted him to kind of think about how sounds the snow melting on a microphone, how sounds, you know, like two icebergs uh, uh, scratching one another and all these things. So it's kind of both is semi-fictional, the sounds and the images. I think it's very interesting. And actually it's a really good lead in to the works that I want to look at in, in just a moment, because in a sense, uh, you are giving a kind of uh, agency 
to the glacier. You're letting it kind of presence itself for us. And you don't put yourself in. We, we never see you looking. There's, no, there's nothing there for scale. We're not experiencing it through you. It just seems like it is, right? We're, we're just able to uh, see it much more uh, on its own terms. And I mean, I think that there's a, a lot of, of thought and talk in, in academic and also not academic circles now about um, you know, granting a kind of uh, sentience or agency to non-human materials, to other species, to other uh, types of matter. And uh, I think that, that this uh, gets at that through your, your process. Um, we definitely feel a kind of uh, a connection there. I'd like to go to the, uh, the next two, which are very, very short videos that we sort of go into this idea of the, um, the non-human, sort of hearing from the non-human. Um, do you think we want to talk about it for two seconds before we show it? Julian, could you tell us what we're going to see? Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, objects in the mirror might be closer than they appear. It's a collaboration that I did with a friend and, and peer artist in Berlin, Julius von Bismarck. Uh, it's actually um, the idea to collaborate uh, with a deer, uh, to actually document or film a particular landscape where, again, uh, human beings are not allowed anymore because they ban themselves uh, through atomic disasters. So we are in the exclusion zone of Chernobyl, a, a zone which today is kind of like, the, and that's, it's funny enough, but one of the biggest uh, involuntary natural reservoir of Europe with one of the most striking uh, ecosystems that you can find with like wild bison and wild horses, some, something that we definitely don't have in the, in the rest of the continent. And some of because like a few hundred kilometers uh, have been closed up after the uh, atomic meltdown of uh, the reactor in Chernobyl. Um, and what we did is actually, because we could not go there, we worked together with a deer. Uh, the idea was to actually film his perception of this particular landscape through his retina and uh, we, we work closely with some biologists and tranquilize a deer and then mount a little camera onto the antler of a deer, which was actually filming the reflection of the landscape on the eye or the retina of the animal. And when the camera didn't have uh, any battery anymore, there was a little motor which will release the camera and there was a GPS uh, sender, which would give us the coordinates so we could get the camera back. And, and then with this footage, we create a kind of like uh, subjective and abstract journey into the reality uh, of the daily life of this, this animal. And we, we actually put it um, together with found footage from uh, early space conquest because we were very interested in this momentum where uh, us as a species uh, try to emancipate ourselves from our celestial body, like getting out of planet Earth and looking at planet Earth from above. And then if, I don't know if you're familiar with this very early, um, early take uh, from space, they're all made by hand. So you really have the subjectivity of the astronaut mm -hmm. into, uh, into the um, rocket, like filming by hand. And in, it's very touching somehow the camera is moving. And obviously uh, the globe becoming another sort of eye or orb. And so we just put those two together and, and, and make this parallel into, uh, for this work. So maybe we let's, can- Let's, let's it. watch it so that you can, you can see how it plays out. And what you hear is actually the hearse beat of, of the deer.
I think it's it's a really interesting juxtaposition. Um, and again, if we think about looking at the, the the earth from the moon or this idea of you know conquering space, just being one more uh, fallible uh, being just using their eyes and seeing it it puts it kind of all on the same level and i think that you know a lot of what we're going to need to do going forward is break down the sort of anthropocentric hierarchies let say some everything that we do is somehow exceptional and humans are so you know special and somehow putting those two things together i think um is a very effective way of of getting that that point across um, you made an, another video um, that we're going to look at in just a moment that I think um, is a very interesting coda to this one, um, although it's quite different. Um, ever since we crawled out, we're going to look at it in just a moment. Uh, what you're going to see are uh, trees being cut down, but there's, there's no visible person with an axe. And I find this one very interesting because to my mind, I read a lot about trees, um, but um, yeah, the idea of trees being, uh, you know, not animate, but certainly sentient uh, and able to communicate with each other, to uh, communicate with other species, to support other species, to be part of these entangled ecosystems, or at a moment where the tree doesn't seem so uh, silent and inanimate anymore. And um, I felt in this one by not having any person there that the tree is sort of crying out for itself. And I, I don't know whether you see a connection between those two, but to me, they uh, they had a connection. You, yeah, maybe we can look at it. Um, yeah. yeah. minute long uh, okay that's enough well not it's only one minute but a video collection uh it's all found footage from the beginning of the century with like the redwood in california over russia indonesia uh, europe and it's all this kind of like moment of of, of falling of tree which have been witnessing you know like hundred hundred of years and and which uh, are now being exploited and um i found it so tragic but also as you say, very interesting to see like, and to hear the kind of like sound of the cracking as kind of like the last, uh, this last voice. And, uh, and then I, I, I put together this, this movie, which accelerates with the time. And it's a little bit of a meditation on, on, on what we are up to outside. And I think that, um, I, I, I don't know the exact connection. I think there's another work we didn't um, talk about, which is a lot about also the, um, this kind of um, other agency, which is uh, some pigeons are more equal than others. Um, we actually uh, color pigeons uh, in different cities um, to actually render their presence in another way and also uh, show the way they're using the urban uh, scape and, and how our cities and facilities in another way, because uh, I, I found very interesting that pigeon can recognize us better than um, four years old kid could. And uh, they're apparently, uh, scientists told me that apparently, when they walk around you on the plaza, uh, they, can, they can see that you are here every day and the same pigeon will come back. But most of us, we never see the pigeon as an individual. We always see as a gray, a gray mass um, uh, or flying rats. 
and uh, just putting one color on them uh, give to our species the possibility to recognize them and give them like another voice. And then with the trees, it's, it's, it's a very um, different approach. It was, it was more kind of like about this, this rhythm and, and this cracking and this kind of like um, uh, yeah, monotony of destruction as well. So you have something very tense, but also through the repetition, it become kind of monotone. And, 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 and it's, again, it's something which happened quite far from our sides and we don't relate to it. So to kind of bring all these images into one uh, place, um, I felt it like it would make very much sense. Do you know what the function was of filming the cutting down of the trees? Yeah, mostly is like, and that's what is crazy about. It's it's like hunting. It's like hunting. It's like game. You know, it's like uh, it's people being extremely proud of cutting giant trees. So it's uh, some of them obviously also had to be cut because they were sick. Maybe they were uh, they had problem and and could fall. But a lot of them, it's for industry. But the bigger the tree is. Uh, the most likely it is that the person cutting it will actually documenting the cut. And you have people standing on tree like trophies, like people standing on giraffes and elephants in Africa. And I found it so striking and, 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 and crazy, awkward and uncanny uh, that I, I actually, I really, I discovered all this footage and I, I really wanted to do something about it. Um, that, that but I decided to put the, the, the human out because I, I don't want it to make it a comment on you know like on this idea of the trophy or like but it was kind of what uh, attracted me uh, to to these particular images but then I saw it would be more interesting to actually like most of my work render the presence of humankind in a very subtle way where the our species is never in the picture but always there so here we are here we're totally here we 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 totally uh, in dialogue or in <laughs> confrontation uh, with the ecosystem, but we, we, we're not there directly. I mean, you don't see a presence. I think one of the only work I did where you really see someone is the first that we saw, and that's someone which is that tiny that it become kind of like an avatar or just a projection surface where a viewer, a, a public can actually uh, feel himself. But I think by, by there being no humans in this one, we know that the tree didn't, you know, decide to fall down itself. The, the presence is obviously implied, but there's something uh, that people always say, oh, if a tree falls in the forest and there's no one there to hear it, will it still make a sound, which is such a silly thing to say as if, you know, you need humans in order to make anything actually happen. And so the soundtrack of this just, you know, these sort of groaning, terrible uh, falling sounds is just um, it is, it, it is a kind of um, uh, almost, almost an animacy, you know, you don't want to anthropomorphize too much, but it, um, the tragedy is, is definitely there. And I think that you, you brought our attention to it, but it's just, it's chilling to think about people, uh, the bigger the tree, like putting antlers on your wall. Um, I can't believe they even made this footage, but I think it's a really fascinating piece. I want to just um, look a, a little bit briefly now at, at two pieces that deal a lot with matter and um, and scales of time so that we have time to talk about the work that's at the Pompidou Center at the moment. So Nick, if we can go to uh, this, I, you know, I, I um, uh, you, you had a, a statement that you made about, um, you know, how we sort of interact with the natural world. You've said that an increased belief in science cannot be achieved without a cultural parallel. There's a need for art that helps give sense to facts. And the next two pieces that um, I, I chose for this talk, I think really get at sort of materials and matter in a very uh, interesting way. So I wonder if um, oh, you can tell us about this one. I'll, I'll, I'll stop talking. Tell, tell us a little bit about this one. Yeah, um, I mean, I can, as, as time is running, but uh, yes. this is a beautiful size space. And um, it's a piece that I present at the Venice Biennale, which is made with the negative of a little uh, extraction facility in Bolivia for lithium brine, lithium being like the substance which kind of 
fuel the mobility of the world. So if you think about the material which represent power, you can think about oil, but you really can think about lithium today. And, and lithium is, is the new kind of like energetical uh, hope and nightmare at the same time. And in Bolivia, very interestingly, they are sitting on the biggest deposit of this material, but it's not have been very much extracted yet because there is no money coming from outside to develop like a large scale mining. And I've been very interesting in the way we interact and engage with landscape. Um, and a lot of time, the scale is, is, is that great that uh, engagement uh, is not meaningful in a way. I mean, you, you, if you're going to a copper mine, you cannot really relate to the scale of the open pit. But here in Bolivia, which uh, what I loved is that the facilities had a family size. So people within the backyard mining for a tiny bit of lithium and bringing it to the communal plants and creating a little bit of uh, brine, which became uh, lithium carbonate and eventually end up in the batteries. And, and, and this kind of like uh, direct uh, interaction and, and, and um, uh, to the landscape, but also to the material which are inside was for me a, a starting point for, for this area of work. And I thought that the serif work was so interesting. I mean, like that lithium was so interesting because it's kind of like another point where past, present, and future are kind of mixing. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, lithium being possibly the material of the future, but coming from the past, like the brine that they extract is somehow like the remnant of a former sea which was there thirty thousand years ago and dried out, but still concentrated under the salt flat. So Uyuni is the biggest salt flat in the world. And it was a sea as uh, the Andes open, you had like a big sea which then dried out, but under the salt flat, you still have like the spirit of the sea and we're taking the spirit of the sea, bring it to the surface and then processing it in order to create lithium. And so what you see here are actually these salt pillars, uh, which for me are almost as, uh, to a certain extent, uh, a, a DNA of the place where you see the strata, you see the time uh, being crystallized and condensed into a material. And this time is then extracted and, and washed and we extract from this time a new time. And I saw that, uh, that being lost in these uh, directories like, you know, was kind of uh, an interesting thing. And then the idea of the negative space or the idea of us living everywhere at the same time. So we are, we are, I mean, I'm sitting here in Berlin, but actually just for me to be able to talk to you, we have to dig a huge amount of copper in Chile, uh, lithium in Bolivia, uh, cobalt in Congo. So each of us is kind of related to all these places uh, without really sensing them. We have all these fingers like going around and, and touching like, places that we shouldn't and, and we're not even aware of it so bringing this material back like the tangibility of the digital world you know because the digital world is something that abstract but it's it's somehow also based on something very real and very uh, material and i um so I, yeah i decided to bring that back to venice and uh, what you see the, the kind of like windows the colors those are different lithium brine which have been concentrated they have this very uh, characteristic uh, color, which almost looks surreal in the desert. When you actually see the mining facilities, you have these bright palettes of blue and yellow and, and orange. And, um, and then I create this, this kind of uh, topography or, you know, like a, a cityscape of some sort, or also like a mausoleum for, for our age. So. Uh I think it's it's very effective. I, I was thinking it's like when you think that beef just comes in a package at the store and you forget that there was a cow ever involved, like the, the detached way that we are from the materials, the supply chains that make everything that we do happen. I think, Julian, if it's okay with you, maybe we should skip over tropism because we are running short on time and I want to make sure that we get to, uh, is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, actually. Um, <laughs> okay, um, I wanted to, uh, I want to make sure that we have time for Julian to talk about the work that's currently there as a, as a lead into it. Uh, we're looking at, at this one, uh, we are all astronauts. Um, 
Do you want me to talk about it? Do you want to talk about it? I can just say okay, just say what it is, and then we just we just end That's up fine. in our last slide. So okay. we are all astronauts. is a collection of uh, thirteen globes. Uh, it's kind of hundred years of history, which have been scratched down with a sandpaper that I produce out of minerals, which were uh, stemming from the hundred and ninety for country recognized as country by the UN at the time I was doing the work. And uh, I actually work with a, a network of embassies and people worldwide to send me some little sample of the world, a very subjective sample, backyards, uh, uh, you know, like different places but that then crush and, and, and produce this kind of international sandpaper. And this international sandpaper were lying down in the studio for a while was a work for itself, it's a little sculpture about the idea of the minerality of the world and the world is kind of like an erosion machine, right? And, and then I, I come up to the idea of scratching uh, one globe in 2011, that's pretty, pretty old one too, but it was more kind of like a one globe as a performance where I would scratch down the surface very, very, uh, uh, very slowly and, and, and the maps will disappear and the surface will get smoothen and more abstract and more abstract. And, and then uh, at the end, it was just this globe lying down on the table. Eventually, after doing that, I reflect and saw that it was kind of problematic to only scratch one globe because one could think, oh, this particular moment of cultural history, that's what the artists want to get rid of. And it was not about that. So I start to systematically uh, scratch down the globes and like every 10 years from the beginning of the century, I didn't went earlier because it was just getting too expensive in terms of acquiring the globes. And then uh, what was very beautiful about the work is that each globe, which is a represent like a frozen moment, like a photograph of a particular geopolitical situation uh, bound with a particular time frame, is also bound with a particular material. So you have the globe, which was made of wood and then uh, papier mache and plastic and glass. And once scratched down, they will uh, have a very different haptic and aesthetic. And what you see on the, on the board is actually the result of the friction of the sandpaper and the globes. So it's kind of a new, a new map, a new cartography of possibilities, of new possibilities. And maybe we go to the next walk because I think we only have five minutes. So if, if uh, it's okay if, if we if we take seven minutes, it's okay. We're okay, doing fine. I, I don't know because I, I have I, it's okay. I know. Put, put the fear of God on you, but let's we'll, let's give it a few minutes, okay? Oh, all right. Um, so basically, <clears throat> for the presentation uh, at Centre Pompidou, it's it's an immersive installation called uh, Weight of Shadows, uh, which is articulated around one piece, uh, which is a, a little film called Pure Waste. And it's, it's an interesting presentation because it's really uh, making a, kind of like a compression or dis distilling a lot of different ideas that I had uh, the last 10 years. And I'm getting back to the very first slide that we saw in 2013 when I was trying to melt the memory, melt the ice under my feet. Uh, I went back to the ice cap a lot of times uh, uh, during the shoot of Towards an Earthly Pole. And uh, I had this kind of like simple observation I never thought of that actually while standing on the ice cap, I was actually standing under the sky, but I was also standing over the sky, uh, over the kind of like celestial memory, over like thousands of billion of tiny air bubble of trapped ancient atmosphere coming or stemming from a lot of different epochs. And that these ones were actually getting slowly released and mixing up with the actual atmosphere of, of our times. And we were really actually losing the, the sky memory. And I, I found just this observation uh, very important. And then reflecting on that, I would kind of like start to think about why are we losing the memory, obviously, because of all the uh, green gas gases and fine particles we're pumping in the higher stratosphere. And this again was uh, it's kind of like this great reversal where our species is digging down and taking the ground and burning it, projecting it into the air. So the ground is becoming the sky and the place where the sky was becoming the ground and where the sky were rel relying on the ground to actually imprint his history in type of uh, linear verticality um, is actually uh, fading or, or, or melting away. 
and uh, and 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 we are here in in the middle of this story as kind of like the main uh, agents of those changes, and uh, and we also actively part of the carbon cycle not only through our emission but also just through our respiration. So uh, the respiration of human being actually somewhat 8.5% uh, of, of how a species emission is actually exhalation. And, uh, and so I saw that, that I, you know, like I wanted to kind of render this minerality of, of the air because air is a medium that we can't relate to. Again, it's like radioactivity. Air go through us and we go through the air. So it's kind of like once the world is going through our body and we're going through the world, it's, is going through the air as a medium, but air is never a material that you really feel, even though you know that life relies on. And then air is full of minerals. And I decided to uh, try to make a counter, um, a counter um, extraction process, a subtraction, where I actually use um, some new technology developed by some Swiss scientists, uh, Dr. Aldo Steinfeld uh, at the Polytechnic University in Zurich. Uh, he developed some membrane where you can uh, capture the carbon which is in the air and using this uh, carbon capture technology i get uh, back the ground which we actually brought up and and collect uh, this carbon and, and and brought it back uh, into a system and then <clears throat> uh, the idea was to actually create some diamond out of this carbon and at some point uh, you know the pandemic kicked in and every border closed and no one was allowed to go out and to move and at this moment uh, our perception of air as a medium kind of uh, exacerbates we were much more conscious of what surrounds us we knew that a space had so many cubic meter of air we knew that so many people could be in a space and that air was kind of like a danger and, and, and a threat and 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 we 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 start to kind of reflect onto our surrounding in a very different way so i decide uh, to actually enlarge a little bit the project and 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 to actually work with a community of people uh, worldwide as a moment where people were not allowed to move out of the house i asked them to send me um, some air balloon to the studio so sending sending me the exhalation and with all this exhalation, I extract the carbon content. And this carbon, I then turn it uh, into diamond. And this diamond, instead of like keeping them, because you know, diamond is kind of like an ambivalent gemstone. It's one is like symbol of purity and eternity, but it's also a very problematic, uh, has a huge cost, uh, social cost, environmental cost. And it's a, a lot of actual, uh, ad added value is not something which is that rare at the end of the day, but something we've brought a lot of problems. So it's kind of a, if we think about the late capitalistic society, you can actually, it's kind of a metaphor for it, I think. And so I decided that those diamonds, which were airborne, I will actually brought them back uh, this summer to Greenland. And I was very uh, luckily invited for uh, an expedition uh, around North Greenland, a scientific expedition, John Venture from uh, Danish permafrost um, institute and, and the, Polar, the Swiss Polar Institute to actually uh, go with them. And I released those five uh, diamond onto the ice cap into a glacier mill, which is these blue holes, which have been drilled by uh, carbon dioxide and where all the meltwater is actually flowing and disappearing. And, and somehow uh, that's, that's kind of this threshold between sky, ground, memories, where everything is just getting mixed up. And, uh, and what you see in Pompidou is then the result of this action is just a hand uh, throwing five diamond into, into a blue hole. Yes. Uh, thank you, Julian. Um, it's interesting. I was just telling Julian before we started that I was looking up the process of making diamonds as opposed to mining them. And one of the things that, that I learned was that uh, when you mine diamonds, they have a lot of other minerals in them. That's why you can have a blue diamond or a yellow diamond or a pink diamond. But when you make them this way, uh, they're actually even more pure. So in some way, it, it's uh, you know even more of a uh, a kind of uh, a a perfect and, and precious object uh, in this form. This is really that uh, that that pure mineral state and. 
I just you know wanted to finish my comments with, with just thinking about you know at this moment where uh, the collective has become very important. The idea of you know people uh, trying to uh, to work together. Um, there's something very essential about the idea of breathing something into existence. Uh, that if, if you know humans are capable of that, that you know they could be capable of breathing something else precious into existence. Uh, anyway, um, but thank you very much. I, I'll I'll stop talking now. I know we'll have some time for questions. Nick, I think I'll let you take over. Uh, yes. Well, I firstly I want to thank you both both so much for um, such an excellent and stimulating conversation that I wish could go on for two or three more hours. But um, we, we are on a bit of a schedule today. So thank you both for sticking to it. Um, we have a couple questions that we can take now from the audience. And I'm first going to pass the mic over to NSC friend and comrade GE Schwartz. Uh, GE, you should be able to turn on your mic now. Thank you so much, Nick. I was wondering, Julian, have you always been drawn to being immersed in the uncanniness of locations, especially the way that beauty can be also often matched with horror? Uh, well, I mean, this is it's a question I, I don't really have an answer, but I'm coming from this place, uh, Switzerland, of kind of everything is perfectly in order and 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 sold as very pure but at the same time only relying on the fact that there are other places which take out trash and uh, i think that's something that also kind of motivate me in going out there and and seeing and experiencing some of these places that i was not relating to with my body and and very early on uh, i discovered traveling as kind of like a strategy to engage with the landscape in kind of like a dialogue and, and to see a landscape as something which is never neutral, but is a collection or, or a crossing of, of so many sensibilities, stories, and, and, and narrative layers. And that the only way for me to actually uh, comment on that was actually to go and, and, and become this, this sort of um, interface you know using the body and exposing myself and i think that's something which fundamental also with the work on radioactivity was even though i never really sense it once you're there with a Geiger counter in your pocket it's a very different sense of exposition and i think that's something which is just um, extremely important uh, for my work and that that actually motivated me to to create and and and, and bring those stories then back so Thank you for doing it for us. Thank you. Thank you, GE and Julian. Uh, next, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Stephanie. Stephanie, you should be able to access your mic now. Is, I think I did it. Perfect. Hi, Julian. Um, I made a comment earlier when you were talking about Towards No Earthly Pole and two things i it was just a sort of no questions here just more observations i personally loved the kind of interwoven um ugh, i wish i could read my comment now the interwoven sounds of the the calving and just the kind of hints of polar landscapes um interwoven into the kind of soundscape i just thought that was great um and then i thought what you said about how you are making these real landscapes in the kind of chiaroscuro of those lights, dioramic. It's really interesting how you managed to do that with the real, and it is sort of full circles back to your early photos of, which weren't in this talk, but um, the sort of mountain landscapes of with your dirt and sand, um, how you kind of then made the dioramic real. And so it's sort of this interesting play between the two. So no questions, just observations. Thank you, Thank you Stephanie. Um, next, I'm gonna pass the mic over to Lynn Crawford. Lynn, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> that was a, a nice little addendum. Um, I have a question. If, uh, if this, first of all, you know, not, not all human cultures were um, treated the environment vicious 
viciously and terribly. Um, and if this were human on human violence that you depicted or massacre, there would be some type of criminal profile or, or legal proceedings or whatever. And I'm wondering, is there any type of psychological um, way of understanding why it is that some cultures abuse the environment and others don't? I mean, I guess that's kind of, uh, I mean, that's the way we're living in, and, and that's the way Occident and the West uh, have been developing the culture, which then have been picked up by everyone somehow. And um, obviously, there should be justice. And, and that's why today it's very complicated to actually speak about the Anthropocene or, or all these questions, um, which aren't um, which is which isn't fair because it's not like the age of mankind is the age of uh, a, a certain type of humankind and and which is very much bound with uh, certain countries and not all of them. But I I don't have the exact question in my work. I'm I'm mostly addressing uh, things which are greater, I guess, and abstracter. But in some of the work, like particularly bikini. We obviously also have a, a conflict of interest. So we have a population which suffer uh, a lot and had to kind of leave the country. And that's why I was talking about this kind of emotional link which have been broken. And it's been broken through uh, colonialization. I mean, it's like 20th century colonialism, which uh, happened, we, we actually use, uh, use a population and, and never really uh, give them anything back uh, if, if there is be a reparation, I mean, I don't think that you can have a reparation about taking the ground of, uh, of people. I mean, there is no reparation, but there have been none uh, and not even a tent. So it's very tragic. Uh, I don't know if this is the, the answer to your question. I was, I was if, I could, if I could just maybe ask. In the psychology of, of, of that behavior, but it's. Well, I mean, if I could just maybe add something to that, um, you know, the, the essence of capitalism is competition and progress, right? And both of these things are very detrimental because they just involve, you know, using it up, extracting resources because you need to keep going. And it's sort of uh, based on this notion of, of competition. Um, and indigenous cultures who work much more in tandem with the environment, you know, see themselves much more as part of it, there's no nature culture binary. That binary has been in a lot of ways the death of us because it's made nature something for us to uh, use as we need and as as we see fit. And um, you know, there are there's a kind of Judeo-Christian religion that says, you know, uh, we're at the top of that food chain, right? We're at the top of the great chain of being. So everything is there for uh, for some of us to use and absolutely you know colonialism treated humans as another resource to use um, and i think now there's a, a very very late hopefully not too late uh reversal you know when we begin to understand the forest as based on collaboration and not competition it used to be seen as the forest was like a race to the sun and man could model itself on it, you know, survival of the fittest. And now we understand that the forest functions as this incredibly collaborative and cooperative entangled system that, you know, if we have a grain of sense, we're gonna to try to emulate. And it was all kind of there for us uh, always. We just were not of the people that uh, that were seeing it. So, um, but I think it, it's, it's certainly um, wrapped up in, in that, um, there's a good website, uh, the Anthropocene Alliance. I'm very familiar um, with that website, yes. Yes, well, let's look at Stephen very Eisenman's uh, discussion using Western artworks of how we got to where we are. I feel like it's one of the most clear explanations of how culture played into the way we deal with the environment. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, for that question, and, and Julian and Julie for that. Um, I uh, am very curious about the Anthropocene Alliance. We'll post a link there in just a second. But um, for our final of the question of the day, we usually go to the rail zone Fong H. Bui. Unfortunately, he's unable to join us today. He's in another meeting, but he sends his best Julian. And um, I'm gonna pass the mic for the final question over to Zelan. And um, 
Silan, I hope that I pronounced your name correctly. Apologies if not, but uh, your mic should be able to turn on now. Yeah, thank you, Julian. Thank you, Julian, for this am amazing, inspiring talk. Um, I have some questions to Julian, especially about your work process. You mentioned often that some of your, like most of your work is grounded in theoretical research, and then you take the granted to go on a field research trip where you document and get inspired and take something back to your studio to Berlin to process the elements that, that you have been collecting. And how is the relationship between your theoretical research and the field research um, to come to this kind of translations and heavy, in a say, conceptual uh, translations in your work? Well, I, <clears throat> I think I, I come more from like uh, the tangible, so it's actually encountering the world and, and, and bringing those items like the fieldwork. I mean, we can call it fieldworks. It's not exactly the fieldworks as scientists uh, will describe it, or, or, but, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a certain praxis of going out and engaging which places which have been stigmatized by our action and then bringing uh, back those dialogue and impression, maybe going back to this place. And then when I go, when I come back, then I create this kind of maps of, uh, of, of sorts. So basically I'm, I'm working uh, in, in kind of like um, cartography where I then uh, write a lot about what I experienced. So I'm also uh, doing, you know, like uh, travel log and diaries. There's one we didn't spoke about, but it's called As We Used to Float. It's a little uh, book, a collaboration with the curator Nadim Saman, which was with me in Bikini. So where we actually collect all these thoughts and, and this time it became a book, but normally it become an exhibition. So I kind of like collect these thoughts, which become images and then putting these images together as they will be words and create, creating like phrases and these phrases can become like a, a show or a story, which is gonna be then uh, developed or, or, or precipitates in a form which become like, a, you know, like an artwork and, and eventually, so I'm actually normally starting for nutrition for a place and, and you know, having a little bit of, uh, of, of background about it, but not extremely deep because I don't want to go to some somewhere with um, knowing everything, because if you know everything, uh, then you don't engage in the same way. I mean, if you ask your smartphone all the time, you will never reflect on the thing you see. So I'm, I'm doing the way around. So I'm going to some places. And then when I come back, I start to dig in the cultural history and, and the, maybe the geology or, you know, like the different aspect of, of a place that I, that I actually encounter. So that would be like a little bit the way I'm engaging. Excellent. Well, I, I want to, um, knowing that we're on sort of a, a tight timeline today, um, I, I want to once again, thank you everyone for sharing your questions. And thank you so much, Julian and Julie, for, um, for answering them. And here at The Rail, we have a tradition of closing our community events with a poetry reading. And today I am honored to welcome to the stage uh, our friend and poet laureate, Matt Reek. Uh, Matt, just a quick bio. Um, writer and translator Matt Reek is the author of five chapbooks of poetry and co-edited the poetry and visual arts magazine, Staging Ground. This November selected satire, 50 Years of Ignorance, a translation of Srilal Shukla from the Hindi is being published by Penguin India. Apologies if I mispronounced that. Uh, you can also read his poetry in the November issue of the Brooklyn Rail. Uh, well, without further ado, uh, Matt passing you the mic. Well, thank you. And I'm so happy to be here. It's such a, such a great event. I've learned a lot. And Merci Julien, c'était formidable, tout à fait. And uh, I'm going to read, so there's five poems in the rail, and I'm going to read two of those. And um, then I'm going to go from something that Julie said about Julien's work about speculative futures, whether they are utopic or dystopic. And I have, um, I'll read half of a poem that sort of occupies that same space. So this first poem is called Some Explanations Are Better Than Others. Some explanations are better than others. Saya asks if Charybdis causes rainstorms. 
Jane has just shown her a picture of a hurricane from outer space. I tell her I'm going to buy some books and I ask if she would like some. She asks for one about all the dangerous places on earth so she'll know where not to go. She asks for one about all the world's animals, just not the venomous ones. I used to replace the word die with perish when her children's books got too graphic. Did that help? On the street, she asks why so many people smoke and I say, it's a bad habit they learn from their parents. Whenever there's an argument at the dinner table, she takes Jane's side, I believe mom. She glares at me when I try to kiss her at dinner. Dad, can't a father kiss his daughter, I ask? Not during dinner, where are your manners? Once I told her the story about getting bitten by a dog in Normandy, now she's scared of dogs. In the park, she spots dogs 100 feet away and insists on being held. Then one day, a dog tries to bite her. Not all dogs are good, just like not all people are good, I say, hoping we're not all bad. Every day, she teaches me scale, proportion, and ambition. I'm trying to read, but her pinkalicious video isn't working. I'm called in to fix it. She may have wanted to play lions at the zoo a moment ago, but now it's irritating to her when I pretend to be Nicholas, the zookeeper. Dad, your dad, stop playing around. She gets a gift of a Sumi paintbrush, paints a Zen masterpiece, a single dwelling teetering high on a hill amid trees under a rainy sky. That's the monastery I'll live in after everything's done, I say, thinking things are almost already over. No one bothers to reply. So this second poem is dedicated to a, a Moroccan writer named Abdul Khaybar Khatibi, who died in 2009. He's um, somebody I translate and somebody who's, who's writing I'm very interested in. It's called Rock, Paper, Scissors. Abdul Khaybar, as a child, you bounced between Rabat and El Jadida. Me, I'm wandering the three worlds of delusion. My left brain is run by petroleum. My right brain is the last hut on a city block bought out by urban developers. Little, little things with big, big meanings. In sixth grade, I was Yasser Arafat for Halloween. It wasn't blackface, it was my face, and I wasn't mocking him. I was trying to educate my neighbors. One simple sentence could save the world if everyone read it and believed. If there's a revolution you want, let it be agricultural. I did the work, but wasn't paid. It became my obsession, and soon I was in a capitalist re-education camp, very expensive. A subconscious quake racked my conscience. I woke up anxious again. It was a hell realm where the trees had swords for leaves that slashed at me with every step. Aste Patra. She died a year after stage four breast cancer was discovered, 78% likelihood. But my mom's friend is still living four years after stage four ovarian cancer was discovered, 17% likelihood. The rich go to the island to play tennis, commute in helicopters to Hampton homes. I'll save you the disappointment of the longer version of my answer, no. My daughter's morning rizzle, riddle posed to me in the bathroom. What made the one clown run into the other clown? I don't know, I say. Another clown pushed him. The poet, electable, if seldom elected, perhaps then not one of the elect. It was phony to complain too much He'd always harbored critical thoughts of the institution. Ask me my name, I'll ask you which one. I have a nickname for every language I speak, an alias for every wedding party I crash, trying so hard to please others. I forgot I was born in between, always one step outside of home. And then this one, this is, uh, so it's called The Other Side in, in 14 Apologias. And I'll read the first, I think it's the first six. Apologia number one. I won't say apologia number one and number two on all that stuff. I'll just pause between them. The other side. Having been left the world to this actual setting, a recess from knowingness, not a reenactment of thought. There they sat in the coffin factory on the edge of town, drinking coffee in a country where they burn their dead, inter them in shrouds, or leave them for the birds to rend flesh from bone, from sinew. Goodbye, it was nice knowing you, she said in her dream, as she clung to the skyscraper, balanced before the tidal wave. Does it matter that the sky is above us, the ground below, or that it's months between the times I touch the earth, 
When I speak, I'm earthbound. The center is an enormous box with nothing inside. I am a figure with limbs, drawable even by a child, bound to repeat the same fraction, standing on a patch of dirt, not waving. To live within the inevitable, don't we? Peeling vegetables, I cut off my hand. I cannot reattach it, but I live on the last essential parts, a band without members, silence, the needed refrain, all throughout the day, all throughout the house. Who speaks to the public? I speak to you. The empty socket, night trains without destinations, welcome to nowhere, they say. Finally, she thinks, something accurate. An elision is the gap between the teeth that have not yet been pulled. To come to a place to claim it, is that possible? Traffic lights are regular, the buttons don't work. You're pushing your mind through the supermarket, alone at 11 p.m. in shorts and flip-flops. It doesn't get better. Back from the laundromat with one fewer sock, no satire, savior. A meteor is coming. A schism cuts through the countryside, north by northwest. Right home. I'm sensitive, naturally, or an incorrigible bastard. Plants grow in the spring, summer. I grew in the winter too, once upon a time, upon a time. If the seafloor isn't even, then why doesn't the sea sink into itself? I dreamed of a back bay where the water going in never came out. Interesting, she said, but from what perspective? All I needed was a simple chair with arms, able to withstand my clutching. All sins heap up a bulbous heap. The monkey bird cries at sunset, why? While I speak to the fog, my Adam's apple catches in my throat. 11 rotations, 13 elevators, one dog with his heinous paws. Oh yes, there was a dragon, a partial dragon, if they make those any more out in the world, a type of wild, typical in its momentary whole. I never learned to value rejection. Every morning I practice in the mirror, my hands held to my sides in a type of phantom prayer. This is what he said to the ocean in a dialect he wouldn't claim to truly know. And the last section is this. So many things that are without irony, a walk, the forest, the scent of spring, the person I know I love, the effect of the wrong words, the wrong thought, the wrong emotion. It's no chase scene with violins, no spaghetti Western. It's just you and me, us, outside of genre. And to know it's real, the most real, the unalterably real. And yet it remains true that I can ruin it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matt. Thank you for uh, sharing your poetry with us. And I encourage everyone to read Matt's poetry in the rail in our November issue and uh, everywhere. <laughs> I want to thank you so much, Julie and Julian, for your wonderful conversation today. I'd like to extend that thank you to Hannah, Fenna, and everyone at Julian's studio for all of their wonderful help. And uh, thank you to Adair and the staff at Sean Kelly Gallery for helping to make today's program possible. Um, I also uh, invite you all to join us tomorrow if you're available for a tribute to the poet Jack Hirschman at 1 p.m. Eastern. We will be featuring Agneta Falk, Luis Rodriguez, Gail Mitchell, Pierre Jory, Tongo Eisen Martin, Andre Quadrescu, Alejandro Marguia, Deborah Major, Cecilia Hirschman, all reading and in conversation with Neely Tchaikovsky. Uh, so thank you all once again, and uh, I invite you all to turn on your mics and to say hello and goodbye as you come and go. And thank you, Julian. Bye. Thank you very much, much for everyone to be here. Thanks, thank Julian. You, Julian. And thank you, Thanks, Julie. Julian. Thanks, thank Julian. Thank you so much for reading Matt. Matt. I win. <laughs> thank you, everybody. And thank you, Matt. <laughs> yes, that was beautiful. Thank you, Matt. Matt, that was a beautiful reading. Yeah. And yeah. very thank funny. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Glad you picked up the humor too. As a father, I identified. <laughs>
<laughs> that's good. That's like, good. Yeah, and the anti-capitalist re-education camp would be very pricey. <laughs> yeah, it would be, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you all again. Take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Be safe and well. Thanks, Julian. Bye, Bye everyone. Thanks. Take Good care. Bye. Bye.